Hey friends, I was invited to give a talk at the Taste of Science meetings a while back, which, as you might have guessed, was cancelled or moved online for the usual COVID-19 reasons. I submitted an abstract summarizing some common problems in the public understanding of genetics, so I was disappointed that I wasn't going to get to tell you all about it. Uh, I've since been rescheduled to later this week, the 20th of June, and the format changed from a formal presentation to more of an online conversation, which is fine. But I thought I'd give you my original talk here. If nothing else, it'll provide a starting point for the conversation. Okay, so I'm speaking from the perspective of someone who has taught college-level genetics for about 30 years. So let me tell you about the common perception of genetics that incoming students have. And I suspect most of the lay people of my audience have the same model of how genetics works in their heads. And I'm sorry to say I'm going to disillusion you today. So here's a common idea that many people have, and that is, that genes specify traits. Each individual has two copies of each gene called alleles, and alleles are either dominant or recessive. And we can calculate the probability of certain patterns of inheritance using, for instance, a Punnett square. This may sound totally familiar to you. This is stuff you might have learned in high school in science class. Uh, if you don't know this stuff, don't feel bad. That means you're just starting from an empty slate and we can get you right, right from the beginning. So are you going to be annoyed if I tell you that every word of that is wrong? Well, not exactly totally wrong. More like grossly oversimplified, applicable to only a few special cases, and a distortion that I have to work to overcome. It's not exactly false. These ideas would have come out of Mendel in the early years of genetics, and they were uh, honestly arrived at. They're just not quite the modern idea. And furthermore, th this interpretation of genetics has led to another misconception. So here's a common idea that genes are located on chromosomes like beads on a string and each gene can be mapped to a specific function. So there's a one-to-one -one correlation between a gene and a trait. Once again, that's totally wrong, except perhaps in a few special cases. It's a model that might have been useful in the early days of genetics, but not anymore. For example, we really don't think of genes as beads on a string anymore. It's a much more complex relationship that's going on in the arrangement of genes on chromosomes. The funny thing is that every geneticist knows that the summaries are wrong. We all know it's much more complicated than that, but we still teach that caricature of genetics as a starting point in part because it is a reflection of the actual history of the discipline. The problem is that all most people recall of genetics is that simple, easily grasped, and obsolete version of the story, and that leads to a host of deeper misconceptions. These misconceptions are widespread and lead to people in positions of power saying very stupid things and making worse policy. have to have the right the right genes i have a certain gene I'm, I'm a gene believer do we believe in the gene thing i mean i do i have a great genes and all that stuff which i'm a believer in i don't believe for a moment that donald trump knows the first thing about genes or genetics not one thing he's got it all wrong so to say he's a believer is um, kind of annoying so some of the misconceptions here is is this idea that genetics is deterministic. We can calculate the individual from their genes alone. 
Also, there's this idea that genes are autonomous in action. That's also false because environment, developmental history, and the effects of other genes are also important. And we also have this idea that every property of an individual is traceable to a gene. Now, again, every credible geneticist knows that those ideas are bogus. But a terrifying majority of the general public takes them for granted as truth. These are beliefs that are used to justify racism, discrimination against the poor, draconian action against crime, etc., etc., etc. Anything that allows authoritarians to abuse groups that they don't like. We have to root out the bad genes, don't you know? Part of the reason for the persistence of bad genetics is that they're still included in textbooks and in high school labor laboratories. So, scratch these ideas out of your head. They don't belong there. They are incorrect. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about some examples of bad genetics. Uh, and several of them are taken from this site, which I highly recommend, Myths of Human Genetics by John McDonald at the University of Delaware. And what he has done is gone through typical textbook, textbook examples and actually tested them, looked them up in the literature, and found the fallacies all over the place. So as he says here, most of the common visible human traits that are used in classrooms do not have a simple one locus, two allele, dominant versus recessive method of inheritance. So that really basic stuff you may have learned in high school, it's true for a few special cases. It does not apply to most of genetics. He also points out that it, it is an embarrassment to the field of biology education that textbooks and lab manuals continue to perpetuate these myths. And it is an embarrassment. McDonald avoids speculation. He just says, somehow, textbook authors decided to ignore the inclusion of false facts in their textbooks. Somehow is an interesting word. And um, I'm afraid I do choose to speculate. Likely possibilities for the continued inclusion of these bad ideas is, uh, number one, professional overzealousness. The people who write genetics book textbooks are geneticists who think genetics is very important. And I agree. And sometimes their enthusiasm gets the better of them. Everything must be genetic, right? And we love simple models. So when we don't understand something, it must be Mendelian. Number two, there are deep societal biases. We don't want disruption of the social order. Therefore, talents, abilities, and potential must be fixed properties of the individual. Everyone has a place and they are born to it. Anything else is chaos. We certainly don't want the underclass to have an uprising because they learn that their, that their worth is not fixed. And number three, self-justification. I'm a college professor. Therefore, there must be something intrinsic to my nature, something genetic to make me what I am. And therefore, there must be causal biological agents underlying every property of every human. It is a curious feature of conservative humans to dislike the idea that we are fluid and flexible and capable of change, and that there's more to being human than what is fixed at conception. But there you go. So let's look at some of the examples of errors that McDonald points out. Here's an obvious one that you may notice as you are running around barefoot this summer. People have different proportions of toes as well as other body parts, but toes are safe to talk about. On some people's feet, the big toe is the longest one. On other people's feet, the big toe is shorter than the second toe. The presence of toes and the length of toes is surely a biological property, so there must be genes controlling this. And yes, there probably are. But understanding it will require something deeper than 
than the simplistic Mendelian schemes people have applied to it. So for example, here's a model. Uh, what if we say that long big toes is coded for by L, the gene L, and S is the allele that codes for short big toe. So we got two alleles. And then we say, okay, S is dominant to L. What that means is that long-toed individuals must be homozygous recessive. That is big L, big L. Short-toed individuals could be heterozygous, LS, or homozygous, SS. Okay, makes sense. Again, if you had high school genetics, this was probably perfectly clear to you. Um, and if, again, if, if you aren't familiar with this, I don't have to disillusion you. So this is the kind of thing we can go out and test. You know, go out to the beach, run around, look at people's toes. It's a little weird, but okay. Look at kids' toes and then ask their parents, you know, to see their toes. And then you can take notes on it. Uh, so there was a British study. It was done in 1914, and it found what was expected. So L by L, that is long-toed parents, two long-toed parents, when you looked at their offspring, all of their children were long-toed, it says. There's some funky stuff going on with the other possibilities, but we won't worry about that right now. Uh, that sounds fine. That fits that model. Then a Swedish study, study was done in the 1960s, I believe it was. And they found something confounding. Okay, look at L by L again. So you look at two long-toed parents. They should only have long-toed offspring. And yet somehow they had three short-toed offspring. That shouldn't be possible in this simple Mendelian model. And then to make it worse, there was a study done in the Solomon Islands, a much larger study. And look at the L by L again there. So 51 of the long-toed parents, both parents long-toed, had offspring with short toes. Again, that should not happen. It says there's something funny going on here. It's much more complicated. Furthermore, that initial study found that 6% of the people had the big toe longer on one foot and the second toe bigger on the other foot. Presumably your two feet are genetically identical. The cells are genetically identical in your two feet. So how could this happen? Okay, it's just saying, no, your simple Mendelian assumption is probably wrong. It's more complex than you thought. Here's another example from McDonald. Uh, can you curl your tongue? I have seen this presented in children's museum, uh, museums as a classic example of Mendelian inheritance in humans, one that can be easily demonstrated when families visit. So it's, it's really a common idea. Go to your local children's museum. You might find a display along these same lines. Uh, there's a problem, though. Again, let's set up our simple Mendelian model. So the model is that we've got two alleles, rolling and non-rolling. And we're saying in this case, rolling is dominant to non-rolling. So non-rolling individuals must be homozygous recessive, that is NR slash NR, while rolling individuals could be heterozygous, that is NR slash R, or homozygous for the dominant allele. So we get out into the real world and we start looking at this. And here's a 1940 study done on this. Uh, again, look at the NR by NR category. So we've got two parents who are non-rollers. They must be homozygous according to the model. Yet of these parents, four had offspring that were rollers and nine had non-roller offspring. Oh, this is confusing. That should not happen if the model were correct. It was shown in the initial study that looked at this and it was wrong, but we still have it in some of the genetics textbooks.
there was a study done in the 1950s. And look at that, the same problem. NR by NR should only produce NR offspring. And yet we got 48 with rollers versus 92 who were non-rollers. This is a mess, okay? It, it, you should look at this and say immediately, well, simple Mendelian models don't work for this trait. Here's another example. I found this claim interesting for a couple of reasons. You know, it, it sounds so definitive. Women should have longer index fingers than ring fingers, or about the same length. Men should have shorter index fingers than ring fingers. And this article is arguing that you can use it also to predict sexual orientation. So if you have a long index finger, longer than your ring finger, that suggests that you are either a woman or a gay man. How interesting. Uh, and of course, as soon as I read this, I immediately put my hands in front of my face and looked, just as I imagine most of you are doing right now. And I discovered that on my right hand, my index finger is a hair longer than my ring finger. Oops, it's kind of womanly, according to this model. And on my left hand, they're roughly equal in length, which is still a supposedly female characteristic. Uh, if this model were true, I'm either a woman or gay. I hope I don't sound too feminine. Not that there's anything wrong with it if I do, but it's not, it's not what I am. And I'm not gay. I don't think. But my fingers, according to this, would be saying that, yeah, there's, you can make predictions on this basis. So I'm immediately suspicious. It doesn't fit me at all. Uh, but this stuff is all over the internet. Not that the internet is a reliable source of truth. Okay, here's another site. And this is a quote from the site. It says, recently strong evidence has emerged that men whose index fingers are longer than their ring fingers, that is, have the, have the aberrant female uh, arrangement of their finger lengths. If they have the long index fingers, they are significantly less likely to develop prostate cancer. Hooray for me! And also, a long index finger correlates strongly with a lower risk of early heart disease. Again, great. Okay, I'm happy to hear that. And it says, but it says, if you have a really long index finger uh, in women, that indicates a higher risk of breast cancer and greater fertility. So, depending on whether you want children or not, that's a plus or minus. Uh, people with relatively long index fingers are also more likely to suffer from schizophrenia, allergies, eczema, and hay fever. This is starting to pile up the correlations, right? And you should be questioning, okay, this sounds a little dubious. Do they really have statistics that are that good? Um, you'll be even more dubious when I tell you that uh, this comes from Joseph Mercola. The quack. Yeah. The pseudoscientific quack who claims all kinds of, uh, kinds of, of absurd um, medical claims. Uh, this is total nonsense. He does not have evidence for any of this. But you might ask, what about the evidence for this difference in length of ring fingers and index fingers and all that? Is there anything to support that? Uh, I went back to the original paper to see if it was a good correlation. And no, it's not. It's not very good at all. So what you see here is a plot of the ratio of index finger length to ring finger length, measured in 400 men and 400 women. Okay, those are pretty good numbers. The point of this ratio measurement, that if the ratio, okay, if you have a long index finger, the ratio will be greater than one, suggesting you're a woman. If it's smaller than one, that indicates that you have a short index finger. The ratio will be less than one, implying that you are a man. Okay, so here's what that looks like. I put a red line up there to show the, the line at 1.0. Everything to the left 
of that red line is supposedly male finger proportions and everything to the right is female. This is not very robust. You really cannot predict the sex of an individual from looking at their fingers. So I guess I don't have to turn in my man card after all. And all of you out there ogling your fingers and looking for a ruler, stop it. It's meaningless. With a large enough sample size and some simple statistics, though, you do find a slight difference in the mean. So women do have an average ratio of 1.0. So ring and index fingers are roughly equal. While men have slightly shorter index fingers and a ratio of 0.98. Okay, that's a 2% difference in the ratio. That's, that's not very persuasive. Um, although I will trust that the statistics bear it out in this sample. For more fun though, here is a plot of the index finger ratios against testosterone levels. Oh, this is great, okay. You might predict that maybe high testosterone could be correlated with stubbier index fingers, that is, more male-like proportions. But I'm looking at that scatter plot, and it looks, oh, it looks awfully meaningless, even if they do try to fit a line to it. There's a lot of outliers there which could have skewed their calculation. And, you know, I'm, I'm, just going to take these curve fitting methods with a grain of salt, as XKCD will tell you. The real problem here is the effort to fit a complex phenomenon to a simplistic model, one that strives to set up a binary dichotomy. Everything must be male female, gay straight, dominant recessive. Furthermore, multiple parameters at multiple levels of organization must be aligned in a simple and consistent way. So sex must force not just your gonads to fall into a specific pattern, but also your brain, your heart, the lengths of your fingers. Genetics is not the tool you can use to support facile black and white models of nature. I know that will break the hearts of many a conservative. So let's think about more about the reality of this situation. What's the reality of genetics? Uh, it's not simple Mendelian. It tends not to fall into the binaries that people would like us to think. You see, most traits are going to be polygenic. So one of the things I try to do when I teach genetics is emphasize that while we use simple models of fly genetics in the lab, for instance, where we've selected mutations of large effect, with obvious discrete phenotypes, that's not a good model of most real world phenomena. The links of your toes and fingers, your ability to curl your tongue, eye color, skin color, intelligence, all these complex details of your existence are almost entirely polygenic. That is not defined by single alleles, but by multiple alleles of multiple genes. Identity is actually combinatorial. So it doesn't fall into a simple binary arrangement. Further, genes aren't absolute and definitive on their own. Their expression is dependent on what other genes are present and on interactions with the environment. It's also important to not make value judgments about traits. Are white-eyed flies inferior to red-eyed flies? Sometimes, depending on the factors affecting their survival. And sometimes not. Is the length of your big toe or your index finger a major parameter in your self-worth? I hope not. So here's one classification of genes and traits. Often we tend to focus on discontinuous traits precisely because they are simple and predictable and fit our easiest models. It's called the streetlight effect. Many of you will already be familiar with this. So yeah, we have made a century of searching for genes that 
fit the expected models. And often we are confused and disappointed when we find uh, you know, genetic effects that don't fit so neatly into that Mendelian distribution. Continuous traits are more common. These can be the product of multiple genes interacting or environmental effects or allelic variation. You can have two alleles that do pretty much the same thing, but at a different rate, a different frequency. Okay, so it's much more complex than the model presented by discontinuous traits. I'm personally very interested in meristic traits. Uh, meristic traits are countable properties like the number of vertebrae in your spine. I'm interested in those because they're far more difficult to comprehend. Every mammal has seven cervical vertebrae. How? What's doing the counting? How is that regulated? We're not going to answer that with a simple Mendelian factor at a single locus with a pair of alleles. There has to be some complex molecular mechanism at work to generate those numbers. It's not going to be boiled down to a single locus. Another thing we talk about in real genetics is expressivity and penetrance. It turns out that the expression of some genes is highly dependent on the genetic background, on the developmental environment, and sometimes just plain chance. And just carrying a dominant allele in your genetic makeup doesn't mean, necessarily mean it will be expressed. So beagles are a great example of this. There's a great deal of variation in the pattern of spotting in beagles. And it doesn't sort out in a simple genetic matter. It's highly likely that genetic factors express themselves in this particular way, that this is ultimately boilable down to some genetics. But this, pa this pattern itself is more complicated than that. The little pedigree I put up there, uh, this, Im this image is often intensely confounding to novices to genetics. It looks like a classic autosomal recessive trait, but it's not. The individual at Q is carrying a dominant allele, but simply isn't expressing it, making it look like a recessive pattern of inheritance. And this often turns up in uh, studies of genetics. Okay, let me wrap this up. The lesson for today. I've got a couple of things I want you to take away from this. Uh, first of all, when discussing genetics, avoid value judgments. Was a flaw to one person might be a virtue to another. Do not concatenate assumptions. An individual might have a particular trait, but it doesn't imply that they have another and another and another creating a false picture from a single data point. So you can't look at one genetically regulated factor like the color of the skin and assume from that that all these other traits, quality of the brain, quality of the heart, athletic performance, all these elaborate, difficult, multi-genetically controlled processes can be inferred from that one property. This is a major lesson for my students. I'm hoping to inspire students to be interested further in genetics. And I say genetics is a mighty fine hammer, but it doesn't mean everything is a nail, all right? In particular, individuals are the products of gene products interacting with each other and with the environment. Don't disregard one component at the expense of another. Don't pretend everything is controlled by a simple Mendelian factor. And that's because reductionism is essential for a beginning of understanding. Gregor Mendel did great work by taking a strongly reductionist approach, finding the simplest possible cases he could, and coming up with some foundational rules for genetics. But that reductionism is not sufficient for a thorough understanding. We start simple because that's what we can be sure of. That's what we can test. Our purpose is to build a more accurate model on that foundation 
and that will inevitably more be more complex. We do not understand everything about heredity. That's another good thing to tell your genetic students. Uh, there isn't some brilliant genius somewhere who knows all of genetics. The smartest people in genetics are going to be struggling to understand complex problems. That's true for the students as well as senior professors. And it's important in an ethical culture to refuse to stereotype people, for example, or flies even, on the basis of limited knowledge, or worse, false knowledge. And finally, this is a universal lesson, nullius in verba, critically assess all claims. Just because you see it written down in a textbook doesn't necessarily mean it's true. You have to look at the actual evidence for it. Okay, so I tell my students this every year in my genetics class. Uh, it's kind of an essential component of the class, I think, is to put it in perspective, defuse the idea that they know much of anything about genetics coming in and that they will know everything about genetics coming out because they won't. So critically assess all the claims. That's important. Okay, thanks. Talk to you all later.